Jesus, everything is great. John chapter 1 and verse number 29, the Bible says this. The next day John seeth Jesus coming and said unto him, and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. May we pray. Father, it's a blessing to be here today. We thank you for the mercy and the grace of God. We thank you for the love of the Lord Jesus. We thank you for your divine presence. We thank you because you're God yesterday, today, and forever. We thank you because we can put our trust in you, know that you do all things well. We thank you, Lord, for every person that's in this congregation today. I pray that you speak to them, bless them, encourage them, and do great things in their life. And then I pray for every person who watches and listens, God, that you'd speak to them. Oh, God, we know that you're a God who meets the needs of your people. And, God, you came to meet the needs of the world. And so I just want to ask you today for your presence and your blessings and your anointing. And I'll thank you for it in Jesus' lovely name. Amen and amen. I want to speak to you today upon this thought introduction. I just want to introduce you to some people, right? I want to introduce you to some people. Uh, I'm sure you've met some of these before, but anyway, I want you to be introduced to them today. First of all, I want to introduce you to God the Father. Because in Genesis 1-1, you're introduced to God in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. So right there, we are introduced to God Almighty. The Bible don't say where God came from. Don't say anything about it. His character or nothing else except he's the creator. He created the heavens and the earth. And the Bible goes on in Genesis 1 and says he created what he created was good. He saw it was good, very good. And I tell you, God is a good creator. He's a mighty creator. He's an everlasting creator. And so you can't find nothing wrong with him. And by the way, tell these evolutionists, they better go back and read Genesis 1-1 because that makes them out a liar. They lie. That makes calls him a liar right there in Genesis 1-1. The very first verse in the Bible calls him a liar. Isn't that amazing? They're running around trying to teach our boys and girls in college and school that we evolved to what we are. That's a bunch of baloney. They need to read Genesis 1-1 and just see what God is. Well, introduce you to God the Father. He's the creator. Number two, I want to introduce you to Abel. The Bible said uh, Abel was the keeper of the sheep. You know, Adam and Eve had two sons here, and one of them was called Abel, and the Bible said he was a keeper of the sheep. The Bible talks about Cain. The Bible said he was a till of the ground. And, of course, Abel was a man of faith. He was a man that believed God. He was a man that put his confidence in God. He believed the word of God because, you see, God had to kill an animal to clothe Adam and Eve. He had to shed blood. It's been blood all the way from the beginning, plumb all the way through. And so God has given us the blood upon the altar, he said, for the atonement for the soul. For it is the blood that makes the atonement for the soul. 
And so it's been blood ever since. And so Adam and Eve, you know, they were redeemed by blood. Abel believed that, and he offered a blood sacrifice. Cain offered the works of his hand. The works of your hands will never get you to heaven. If you're dependent upon your works, you'd just as well as to trash it because they'll take you down, down, down. And then there's Noah. The Bible talks about Noah. Let me introduce you to whole Noah. The Bible said when he was born, he was the son of Lamech. The Bible said, the same shall comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the curse of the ground which the Lord God cursed. And so Noah was going to be a comfort. Of course, he was going to be a great comfort to, uh, of course, his family, of course, but then the world wouldn't believe. And we know that Noah was a man of righteousness, a man who preached the word of God and believed. And so we see Noah. But let me introduce you to another fellow. His name is Isaac. The Bible says in Genesis 17, God was talking to Abraham, and he said he was going to give him a son. He said, I will establish my covenant with him or an everlasting covenant with his, with his seed after him. And so we know that Abraham, uh, God established his covenant with Abraham, gave him the Abrahamic covenant. He passed it on to Isaac, and then later on he passed it on to Jacob. And so he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You read that many times in the Word of God, and that's the reason because he's a covenant-keeping God. He will keep his covenant with Abraham. He will keep his covenant with Isaac. He will keep his covenant with Jacob. He will keep what he promises, folks. He will do it. He never goes back on a promise. And then there's Esau. You know, Esau, the Bible said in Genesis chapter 25, was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. Uh, Esau represents a man of the world. He's a man who loves the world. He loves uh, to live in the world and uh, uh, survive in the world. Well, there's a lot of folks, that's what they are. They're men of the world. They live in the world. They don't have anything to do with God and not interested in God and those things. But the Bible said Jacob was a plain man, dwelling in tents. That word plain means he was an undefiled man. He was an upright man. Jacob was an upright man. He sat on the knees of old Abraham, and Abraham told him about uh, the Abrahamic promise, and he sat on the knees of his father Isaac, no doubt, and he told him about that promise. And he believed God. He believed the promise of God. Oh, see, Esau, he didn't have time for God. He didn't have time to go to church. He didn't have time to sit on Abraham's knee and listen to those great promises. He didn't have time to sit on Isaac's knee. No, he was too busy out there in the world hunting. And so that's the way a lot of folks are too busy to serve the living God. Oh, friend. And so let me introduce you to somebody else. Number eight, this is Moses. Let me introduce you to old Moses. Uh, you've heard about my little Moses. Let me introduce you to Moses. The Bible said when he was born, he was a goodly child. They looked at him and said he's a goodly child. Well, the Bible, uh, well, the Bible don't say, but they looked up that word good. It means beautiful. It means cheerful. It means joyful. It means loving and pleasant and precious and uh, sweet. Well, old Moses was a sweet little baby, wasn't he? He was a pretty little old baby, and evidently he was a, a laughing baby. Uh, you've seen they had something on uh, TV not too awful long ago, this little old baby laughing and laughing and laughing, and Tammy's little old grandbaby, they sent us a, sent Karen a picture on her phone, and this, uh, well, it might have been on Facebook, I don't know, I can't keep with all that stuff, but anyway, that little old grandson, I mean, day he's a laugh and he's a doing this, he just laugh and laugh. Well, I believe that's the way Moses was. He's a happy little old baby. He is a beautiful little old baby. Well, hey, God went on to make something beautiful out of his life, right? A lot of beautiful little old babies turn out to be wicked men and wicked uh, women, right? But, hey, they ought to go on and serve the living God. Then to be introduced, number nine, to Joshua. Oh, Joshua, the Bible said, well, he was a young man and followed Moses around, but then when the, his name is first used, the Bible said uh, Moses chose Joshua to go out and to fight with Amalek. He said, go out there and get some men to fight Amalek. Joshua, go out there and get some men to fight Amalek. Joshua didn't say, I ain't going to do it. You know what the Bible said? So Joshua did, as Moses had said unto him, and he went and fought with Amalek. That was the life of Joshua. He was always doing what he was told to do. And, of course, he became the great leader of Israel and the commander-in-chief, right? Then let me introduce you to somebody else. There's a little fellow by the name of David. Well, when you find out about little David here, first of all, he physically, the Bible, you know, not many people in the Bible described about the physical looks. We have nothing much about Jesus in the physical looks, right? But we do have a little bit about David. The Bible said he was the youngest of eight children of Jesse. Jesse had eight sons, and... Uh, David was the youngest one. Well, you say the Bible said another place seven. Well, one of them must have died. You know, you don't, sometimes people read that thing. They say there's a contradiction in the Bible. No, there's a contradiction in your interpretation. That's the problem. And then the Bible said he was ruddy. And, uh, and with all a beautiful countenance and a goodly person to look at. He was kind of red, reddish, you know. Uh, he may have had red hair. I don't know. You said Jews have red hair. I saw a Jew had red hair. 
And so he must have maybe had red hair, but in here he is reddish. He had the reddish color, but he was a, he was a beautiful young man. But notice something else about him. The Bible said, 1 Samuel 16, that uh, the Bible said the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. There is the commentary on his success. The Spirit of God came upon David from that day forward. That makes all the difference in anybody's life is the Spirit of the living God. What can you do without the Spirit of God? You're like a big airplane sitting on the runway with no fuel in it if you don't have the power of the Holy Ghost. Well, I introduce you to those in the way of introduction. Let me introduce you to some other folks here. You met these folks, I'm sure. Let me introduce you, first of all, to Mr. Don't Care. <laughs> There's a lot of folk like that around, right? Mr. Don't Care. Well, I'm not interested in anything you have to say. I'm not interested in your tracts. I'm not interested in your Bible. I'm not interested in your religion. I met a few of those folks along the way, right? Have you ever met any of them folk? You'll find them out there, Mr. Don't Care. They don't care what you say about Jesus Christ. They don't care what you've experienced. They don't care about your tracks. They don't care about your Bible. They don't care nothing about Jesus Christ. You know what's going to happen to them in the hell? They're going to lift their eyes and cry like the old rich man in Luke 16. But it'll be too late then. I'm telling you, folks, I'm glad one day I sat on the Word of God and I got a care in my heart. I did care, brother. I did care. I do care where I'm going, don't you? I care about my soul. They don't seem to be care about their soul. Hey, you better care about your soul. you got a soul that's going to live on and on and on and on and on. Somebody said, when I die, that's the end of me. No, that's not the end of you. That's just the beginning of you. Well, I know you've been here maybe 60 years, 70 years, 80 years, how many years you've been here, but I'm telling you, eternity starts. For you, and you're going to be there somewhere forever, either in heaven or hell. And so, Mr. Don't Care, oh, hey, I hope you do care, right? I hope you do care about your soul. I hope you do care about where you're going to spend eternity. I do hope you care about that, because if you don't, you're in sad, sad shape. I want to say, number two, let me introduce you to somebody else. You've met him, too, I'm sure, Mr. Procrastinator. Well, you know, I, I, I know now, preacher, I know what I ought to do. I know I ought to get right. I know I ought to get saved, and I know I ought to go to church, and I know I ought to live right, but I'm not ready. You know, I've had old people to tell me that. I've had people 80 year old to tell me I'm not ready. I said, Lord, have mercy. When are you going to get ready? You got one foot on a banana peel and the other in the grave, and you're saying, I'm not ready. I mean, you're on the precipice of eternity, on the very precipice of hell itself, and saying, I'm not ready. When are you going to get ready? Today's the day of salvation. Tomorrow you could be in eternity. Tomorrow you might be in hell, lifting your eyes like the rich man. Hey, today's the day of salvation. Now's the accepted time. Give your heart to Christ now, today, today. Because if you don't, you could be lost and lost forever. I remember the story that was told about these farmers out in the Midwest going across, you know, reaping the fields, the great wheat fields of the Midwest. And all the farmers were working together, you know, and they was going together and reaping the fields, coming to them, and they came to this one field. up. It wasn't time to quit, but it maybe in the later part of the day, and they had time to do a lot of the field. If they had, maybe they had finished it, I don't know, but they said, let's just wait till tomorrow. Let's just wait till tomorrow. And that night, a great storm came. The next morning they got up and all that wheat was laying on the ground. It's too late. Procrastination is a thief of time. You see, you don't have to do anything real bad to go to hell. All you got to do is just do nothing. Do nothing, do nothing. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Mr. Uh, procrastinator, I've got plenty of time. Some other time, preacher. Some other time, church. Some other time, Jesus. Some other time, God, I don't want to do it now. I got plenty of time. That's what you don't have much of is time. I want to say number three, let me introduce you to Mr. Do Good. <laughs> Mr. Do Good. He thinks that he's going to heaven because uh, he does good. He's a person always doing good. He, he's, uh, I don't drink and I don't cuss and don't do drugs. and You know, I don't do all them other things. I don't uh, run around on my wife. I work hard. I pay my bills. I'm doing good. <laughs> what else do I need to do? You need to get saved. That's what you need to do. You need to surrender your heart to Christ. Without Christ, you can't go to heaven. And so a lot of folks want to do good, you know. They say, I paid my debts, and, you know, I tend to my own business. I don't bother my neighbor. Don't bother anybody. Don't gossip. Sound like a pretty good person, but you know what? 
That's not good enough to take you to heaven. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood. The only thing that can wash your sins away is the blood of Jesus Christ, God's darling son. And if you don't trust him to wash your sins away, brother, you'll be lost and lost forever. And so there's Mr. Do Good. Let me introduce you, number four, to Mr. Have a Good Time. You ever met him? Have a good time. Well, I'm too young I, I, to give my heart to Jesus. I've got too much living to do. I've got to kick up my heels and have a good time. Hey, you know what? Uh, uh, Mr. Good Time, you know, he, uh, he likes to party and he likes to drink and he likes to dance and he likes to live in the light, the bright lights, the nightlife. He likes the nightlife. He likes to go to the pop concerts and, the, and the, you know, the rock concerts and all them big concerts. He likes to kick up his heel and have a good time. And, boy, I can't, I can't go to church and get serious with God. I'm having too good a time. But wonder what happens when old man death calls knocking on your door. All you got to do is look in the obituary and you see people every day that's young. They're too young to die, right? Oh, brother, I'm telling you, it's a serious thing. It's a serious thing. But they don't seem to have time. they uh, just uh, looking for a good time. They're uh, pleasure seekers, you might say. Seeking pleasure. Hey, brother, there's pleasure in Christ. There's joy 